Welcome. My name is Bill Pacara, and I'm one of the fiction and media librarians at the Northbrook Public Library. And on behalf of our partner libraries at Arlington Heights Memorial, the Gunview Public Library, and the Addison Public Library, I would like to welcome you to tonight's program, 33 and a third, Carol King's Tapestry with author Lauren Glass. We are in month two of our year long series of authors talking about their 33 and a third book and its classic essential album. 33 and a third is a series of short books about popular music, each focusing on an iconic album. We are excited that you're joining us tonight and hope you consider joining us for future 33 and, event, 33 and a third events all taking place on Zoom. We will be monitoring questions throughout the presentation and we will address those following Lauren's presentation. Lauren Glass is a professor and chair of English at the University of Iowa, specializing in 20th and 21st century literature and cultures of the United States with an emphasis on book history and literary institutions. His most recent book is Counterculture Colophon, Groove Press, The Evergreen Review, and The Incorporation of the Avant-Garde, republished in paperback by Seven Stories Press under the title Rebel Publisher, Groove Press, and the Revolution of the World. He is a member of the Post 45 Collective and co-edits their book series. With that, I'm extremely excited and happy to introduce Lauren Glass. Thank you so much, Bill, and thank you, Michael and Neil, and thank all of you for uh, being here. I can't see you, but I know you're out there, and I know you have a special relationship with this album. Uh, it's really been remarkable having written this book and hearing all of the stories and, and feelings and anecdotes and attachments uh, that people have with Tapestry. I'm going to read a little bit from the book, some of which will talk about my own uh, memories and experiences uh, with Carol King's Tapestry, and then we'll open it up for questions, and I look forward to hearing your stories as well. I'm going to start with the introduction, and then I'll skip a little bit through it. I'm going to actually skip over the uh, more detailed analysis I have of the album, so you'll have to get the book to, to see that, but I think you'll get a good sense of where I'm coming from. One of my earliest memories is of my mother's consciousness raising group, She Who, chanting in a circle in the living room as I lay alone in bed. She who plays with words, the women would intone in unison. The syntactical ambiguity of the haunting refrain echoes in my memory against the voices of the singer songwriters whose albums my mother played as I was growing up. They formed a kind of serial air sets lullaby and the albums are surrounding me right now. Joni Mitchell, Laura Nero, Holly Near, Phoebe Snow, Aretha Franklin, Chris Williamson, Roberta Flack, Nina Simone, and of course, Carol King. I still have my mother's ring-worn copy of Tapestry. I'm still comforted by You've Got a Friend, and I still tear up to the chorus of It's Too Late. My mother left my father the, and, and joined the women's liberation movement in 1970. I was six and my sister was four. Like Carol King and her children, we had just moved to California from New York City. And from that point on, my sister and I were counterculturally co-parented. Mom came out as a lesbian and her lovers became a series of figures modeling alternatives to the patriarchal nuclear families in which they had been raised. She who, as I was to learn much later, was in fact a set of poems composed to be read aloud communally and collectively by lesbian feminist activist, Judy Gron, a founding member along with her partner, the graphic artist, Wendy Cadden, of the Gay Women's Liberation Group, the Women's Press Collective, and a Women's Place bookstore located at the intersection of College and Broadway in North Oakland. Dad rapidly resettled with a free spirit from Florida, who at the time was living in a Berkeley commune called Home Place. I remember him telling me that of the three women he was sleeping with at the time, she was the only one who knew there was going to be a revolution. That was apparently good enough as they would move in together and have three more children in rapid succession. They married much later. Indeed, divorce in the San Francisco Bay Area in the 1970s was the norm. Most of our parents were separated or divorced, and we all shared in the disorders and discoveries that accompanied their attempts to negotiate the new domestic landscape. It was a time when my fifth grade teacher could sleep with my best friend's mother and take me and my sister to see an afternoon screening of the X-rated film, Flesh Gordon, though not on the same day. 
Our parents knew they didn't want to raise us as they had been raised, but they had few models upon which to base alternatives. For my mother in particular, it was crucial that my sister and I be brought up aware of the sexism and stereotypes that had shaped her own childhood and adolescence as the child of Holocaust survivors in Modesto, California. The goal was to raise a self-confident girl who wouldn't be fucked over and a sensitive boy who wouldn't fuck anybody over. Like Laurel Canyon to the south, the Bay Area was a countercultural cauldron of social and sexual experimentation. The 1960s had officially ended at Altamont. My parents had attended but left before the Stones came on because the vibe was so bad. And as the wave of utopian radicalism receded into recent memory, the activists who had survived settled down, had children, and tried to put at least some of their principles into practice. Civil rights and black power had transformed the nomenclature of our geography. Grove Street was renamed Martin Luther King Jr. Way, and my elementary school was renamed Malcolm X. Sex education, called social living, began in sixth grade and continued every other year up through graduation. The first book we used, Show Me, a picture book of sex for children and parents, has since been banned internationally as child pornography. All of my social living teachers were young, hip women, entirely comfortable talking to teenagers with candor about and sensitivity about sex, including contraception, masturbation, and homosexuality. They reminded me of my mother and stepmother. And tapestry was in heavy rotation. It was in the air, both AM and FM, and on turntables all over the Bay Area. It pervaded both public and private space. Everyone heard it and sang it and bought it. And unlike prior generations, we children of the counterculture shared our parents' musical tastes. In the car and in living rooms, we listened and sang along together. In the 1950s and 60s, rock and roll had divided the generations. Indeed, it was one of the main markers of the generation gap. In the 1970s, rock, as it was now called, was more likely to unite them. We all listened to the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, to the Grateful Dead and Jefferson Airplane, and of course, the Carol King. Tapestry opens with the piano, Carol King's native instrument. It is the instrument of composition, the instrument for people who can read and write music. It is also a traditional American status symbol as the ability to afford and architecturally accommodate an upright piano signifies that your family has made it to the middle class. Not surprisingly, it was the first piece of furniture in Sydney and Eugenia Klein's semi-detached two-family home in Brooklyn. It was on this old upright that four-year-old Carol Klein received her first lessons from her mother, Jeannie. Later on, a studio upright would be the instrument on which the recently married Carol King composed hit songs with her husband, Jerry Goffin, in the cramped cubicles of Aldon Music on 1650 Broadway in Manhattan. For tapestry, King played a Steinway Grand and spurred partly by the album's explosion into the national spotlight in 1971, the stately Steinway would become a resonant symbol of the, fam of the female singer-songwriter in contrast to the more masculine guitar of folk rock icons such as Bob Dylan, who couldn't read music. The image of Carole King sitting and singing behind a massive grand piano with a halo of hair still stands as a synecdoche for the 1970s singer-songwriter sound. For me, the aggressive minor seventh chord that opens I Feel the Earth Move introduced an earthquake. We were in California after all, and rumor has it that there was in fact an earthquake on King's birthday in the year of Tapestry's release. But now I realize that the song is really about sex, about female desire, and indeed about female orgasm, which has been represented by earthquakes at least since Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls and by the thunderstorms, at least since Kate Chopin's The Storm. As Ann Powers eloquently affirms, the song is a gospel shout out to the feminist cause of orgasms for all. And as Judy Kutilis notes, the rhythm mimics an orgasm, building to a climax and then slowing down languidly. The chords and melody complement this rise and fall as the relative minor of the opening chorus modulates into the dominant major seventh chords of the verse until after the third and concluding iteration of the chorus, the sky comes tumbling down over and into a descending progression of minor and major sevenths that bears King's inimitable musical signature. Carol King is the queen of chords. Her brilliant progressions are the rich soil bed in which her elegant melodies grow. 
and this canonical intro confirms a clear compositional authority as the piano pounds alone for two measures before Charlie Larkey booms in with his octave bouncing bass line. The seamless accompaniment is fitting as Larkey was King's second husband, two had been married on September 16th, 1970 in a traditional Jewish wedding and therefore presumably the one making the earth move, biographically speaking. Once Danny Cooch Korchmar's guitar starts to fill in around the vocals in the second chorus and can sense the comfort level of the entire ensemble, which had been rehearsing in King's Laurel Canyon living room on Wonderland Avenue. It is the sound of Carole King, but also the sound of California, which unlike New York City, featured large spacious houses with, with large living rooms where musicians could jam as loud as they wanted for as long as they wanted, a new experience for King, who was accustomed to cramped rehearsal rooms, production deadlines, and suburban subdivisions. But collective as the rehearsals were, the division of musical labor on the album is clear throughout. As Larky, uh, Cooch, and the other accompanists subtly and surely subordinate themselves to the piano and voice. And the voice asserts itself effortlessly. It is not an exceptional singing voice, but this is precisely what gives it a specifically sexual strength in this opening song and throughout the album. As countless listeners have testified, Carol King's singing voice sounds intimate and familiar, relatively thin in timber and limited in range. It nevertheless communicates a unique combination of passion and professionalism in service to the song, whose lyrics are in turn always understandable and relatable. It is a voice that invites singing along, a voice that gets in your head and never leaves. It is also a gracious voice, one that has gladly ceded its place to the innumerable other voices who have covered King's songs and made them their own. It is the voice of a friend. And you've got a friend, which opens side two, is a true musical masterpiece. Inextricably linked, though not directly inspired by, James Taylor, who made a mega hit out of it in the same year. The song epitomizes the relational force field of the entire album, which invites us in and then in turn insinuates itself into the pleasures and pain of our own personal lives. Taylor had been introduced to King by Korchmar, a childhood friend and musical collaborator at the Night Owl Cafe in Greenwich Village in 1967. And their lifelong platonic friendship embodies the spirit of the album and indeed of the times, which radically expanded the scope of what it meant to have a relationship. Theirs is a friendship based in and lived through music, a friendship that has persisted across many marriages and moves, both emotional and geographic. Taylor's guitar is mixed way down on this track, subordinated not only to King's voice and piano, but also to the string ensemble. But in later live performances, some quite legendary, their intuitive musical understanding is audible and awe-inspiring. The magic of this song, which also modulates from a relative minor chord sequence, this time the opening verse, which elegantly encapsulates the lonely desolation everyone feels at some point in their lives, to a dominant major chord sequence in the famous chorus, which heralds the arrival of the friend on call in all seasons, is that, is that it can represent any relationship on which you can rely, from friend to lover to family member. For me, it is as a mother that King sings, and many of the men who contributed to the album describe her as the earth mother of the studio, providing both cookies and comfort. But the song is about anyone you can count on. We all have or want a friend like this. One friend on whom King knew she could rely was producer Lou Adler, who is crucial to the success of Tapestry. When King arrived in Los Angeles in 1968, Adler was already one of the key architects of the emergent California sound and scene, both North and South. Having recently produced San Francisco, Be Sure to Wear Flowers in Your Hair, and California Dreaming, with its aching invocation of LA, both written by the Mamas and the Papas musical mastermind, John Phillips. Adler had met Phillips through Barry McGuire, whose Eve of Destruction had been a huge hit for his label Dunhill Records. 
The mamas and the papas would in turn become Dunhill, Dunhill's star act and cash cow. Can you believe your eyes and ears was in heavy rotation in both my houses and the controversial cover photo of the mamas and papas in a bathtub next to a toilet constitutes one of my earliest album cover memories, eerily indicating in retrospect the polymorphous perversity of the period. At the time, the plurality of the mamas and papas seemed expansive and liberatory, signifying that family arrangements didn't have to be restricted to standard nuclear fam form. My sister and I moved back and forth between two alternative domestic arrangements, a lesbian household in which my mother's partners constituted part of a larger community of radical women in the Bay Area, and an ever-expanding second family, which kept the spirit of the 60s alive with Bay Day festivals, communal child care, back to the land adventures growing cannabis in Humboldt County. We had lots of mothers and fathers, and they were also friends. It was a new social frontier, epitomized by the legendary Monterey Pop Festival that Adler co-produced co with Phillips, literally bridging Northern and Southern California and launching the careers of Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin, generating industry interest in the entire West Coast scene. Adler had been a hustler in the music industry from a young age, joining with his friend Herb Alpert in the early 1960s to form Herb B. Lou Productions. The two co-wrote What a Wonderful World with Sam Cooke, with whom Adler would work closely until his tragic and untimely death. He met King in the early 1960s through her first employers, Don Kirshner and Al Nevins, when he went to New York in search of songs and returned to LA as manager of Al Don's West Coast headquarters. One of the first things King did upon arriving in the West Coast was to look him up. Adler had recently sold his shares in Dunhill Records in order to start Ode as his personal label, allowing him to work more closely and exclusively on albums with artists of his choice. A quiet man with a calm authority in the studio and a cool confidence in public, Adler had a shrewd eye for talent and was committed to King. His job as he saw it was to realize her vision and he knew she had a vision with this album. He had famously predicted to Cooch that it would be the love story of LPs. He had also protected her privacy. When King told him she didn't want to do any publicity, he conducted his own informal set of interviews with her and sent the results out in response to the slew of requests from reporters that came out in the wake of the album's smash success. Ode was one of a number of companies making use of the A&M recording facilities housed on the second story of Charlie Chaplin's old Hollywood studio lot on 1416 North La Brea Avenue in 1971. Joni Mitchell was making Blue for reprise in Studio C, and the Carpenters were recording their eponymous album in Studio A. James Taylor, who was dating Mitchell at the time, was recording Mudslide Slim and the Blue Horizon, which would include his version of You've Got a Friend, with producer and manager Peter Asher at Crystal Sound a few blocks away. The cross-fertilization between projects and personnel was generous and generative, and the collaborative atmosphere is illustrated by the many names that recur across album credits. Indeed, singular as it is, Tapestry was also the product of a Laurel Canyon community whose creative apotheosis it would come to epitomize. In addition to Taylor and Mitchell, David Crosby, Stephen Stills, Neil Young, and Graham Nash would produce collaboratively and separately, Deja Vu, If I Could Only Remember My Name, Stephen Stills, Songs for Beginners, After the Gold Rush, and Harvest. As with King and Taylor, CSNY was a collaborative, if somewhat more fractious, singer-songwriter collective, touring together and playing on each other's albums as an experience of a larger, as an expression of a larger cultural scene. The liner notes on these albums are a veritable who's who of Laurel Canyon, which was becoming the epicenter of the popular music industry that would soon explode into mainstream hegemony with chart-shattering albums and blockbuster world tours by artists such as the Eagles and Fleetwood Mac in the mid-70s. Tapestry was released on February 10th, 1971. Its iconic gatefold cover with Jim McCrary's classic photo of the calmly confident and casually barefoot singer songwriter comfortably seated with her tapestry in her lap and her cat Telemachus on a pillow in the window seat of her Laurel Canyon home provides a perfect visual and verbal complement to the songs whose lyrics are featured on the back in a practice only recently inaugurated by Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band and then made de rigueur for the singer-songwriters of the 70s. Countless fans of all genders and ages and ethnicities have read these lyrics as they listen to this album, etching them into our collective memory. 
Inside the gatefold is a photo of the tapestry itself, subtly signed with a curling C-shaped length of yarn and featuring a small country house and side building surrounded by trees and animals, a bucolic fantasy king would later rustically realize in the mountains of Idaho. If you look carefully, you can see the words thank you unobtrusively st stitched into the bottom right-hand corner. They are addressed to Adler, to whom King gave the tap tapestry as a token of her appreciation. It is flanked by photos of King and her musical collaborators, bassist Charles Larkey, guitarist Danny Cooch Korchmar, drummers Russ Kunkel and Joel O'Brien, backup singers James Taylor and Jody Mitchell, engineer Hank Sicolo, and producer Lou Adler. The inner sleeve is ostentatiously dominated by an enlarged image of Adler's owed records trademark, an enormous O spiraling into a smaller D, which in turn encircles a lowercase e. The trademark is designed in turn to look like a spindle adapter, felicitously signifying King's career move from singles in the 60s to albums in the 70s. And indeed, I'm going to skip ahead now to the 60s to talk a little bit about King's earlier career, which not everyone knew about when Tapestry came out, um, as a uh, song, one member of a songwriter team with her husband, Jerry Goffin. So this is the beginning of chapter one, Maturity. Tapestry was a declaration of independence for Carol King, marking the culmination of her break from the lucrative and already legendary collaboration she had with her ex-husband, Jerry Goffin, and the Brill Building assembly line songwriting system within which they worked in the 1960s. But the album also includes two songs, which were products of that collaboration, Will You Love Me Tomorrow and You Make Me Feel Like a Natural Woman, leading the listener back to her earlier career as one half of a successful songwriting team for Al Nevins and Don Kirshner's Al Don Music, founded in 1958 where alongside legendary tunesmiths Neil Sedaka, Neil Diamond, and Paul Simon, and in friendly rivalry with Barry Mann and Cynthia Weil, King and Goffin wrote a string of hits for other artists, including Don't Bring Me Down, Take Good Care of My Baby, Chains, One Fine Day, The Locomotion, I'm Into Something Good, and Up on the Roof, among many other songs, among many other lesser known songs that didn't make the charts. All of these songs were singles geared toward AM radio and the lucrative teen market and became collectively known, associated with the Brill Building a few blocks down Broadway from Aldon, the first song publishing company dedicated exclusively to rock and roll. And Carol Klein's youth coincided with the birth of rock and roll. She grew up listening to inaugural hits such as Rocket 88 and Rock Around the Clock on the radio, attending Alan Freed's landmark integrated stage shows at the Brooklyn Paramount, where she saw the likes of Jerry Lee Lewis, Chuck Berry, Fats Domino, and Little Richard, and watching Elvis Presley's first performance on the Ed Sullivan Show on her family's black and white TV. Her discovery of rock and roll, she claims in her autobiography, coincided with her increasing awareness of the lower half of her body, and that primal connection between puberty and backbeat would inform many of her hits with Goffin. But she had other musical, early musical influences. Her mother began taking her to Broadway musicals in Manhattan when she was five, after which they would listen to original cast recordings on a portable record player, giving the future composer an early idea of how an album might cohere as a thematically linked series of songs that tell a story. Full cast recordings of, of shows such as Carousel, Oklahoma, and South Pacific were in essence early iterations of the concept album that would be so central to the rise of rock music as an art form and lucrative collaborations between industry professionals such as Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein illustrated the ways in which composers and lyricists could not only write hit songs, but also create best-selling albums. She took piano lessons from an early age, but like her mother before her, she didn't like them. Instead, she learned mostly by ear, copying songs from the radio and playing along with records. Gifted with relative pitch, which is the ability to play a song or hear a mel melody after hearing a single note, she was a fast learner as was, and was encouraged by both her parents. The household was not a happy one. Her parents, Sid and Jeannie, fought often, and the friction between them was exacerbated by having to care for Carol's severely disabled little brother, Richard, who was institutionalized at a young age. Carol was close to both parents, but they were growing apart from each other. They separated when she was 11 and eventually divorced, though her father stayed close to the family throughout Carol's adolescence, and the two eventually remarried. As an adult, King has attributed the conciliatory and comforting tenor of her lyrics to her peacemaking role as a daughter, 
and her desire, common among children of divorce, for a stable domestic environment, a home. It is a desire almost inevitably frustrated by the tendency to repeat the divisions and discord that originally provoked it as King four marriages, King's four marriages and divorces attest. Whatever the tensions, her parents were supportive of her ambitions and she was ambition, ambitious. <laughs> Carol Klein had already changed her name to Carol King, shrewdly replacing the ethnic with the aristocratic and establishing the premise for many gender bending headlines formed a doo-wop band, conducted an orchestra, and recorded two songs for ABC Paramount when she entered Queens College at the age of 16. There she met and made a few demos with another ambitious young musician named Paul Simon, but they were just friends and never wrote any songs together. She wanted a boyfriend and needed a lyricist, and she got both when she met Jerry Goffin, a night student three years her senior. At the time, Goffin apparently wanted to write a musical play about the Beat Generation, but in the end, he would write, or at least publish, nothing but song lyrics. Other than a few obituaries when he died in 2014, very little has been published by or about him, except in relation to King. Like her, he was a child of divorce, but if her childhood experiences made her long for a happy, stable family environment, he was clearly more restless and emotionally unstable. Nevertheless, Carol was smitten, and, through her, and though her father, no longer living with the family, but still very much present, strongly disapproved, Coven Fre Goffin frequently spent the night in the Klein household. She quickly became pregnant, and the two were married in a traditional Jewish wedding ceremony in August 1959. She was 17, and he was 20. Initially, he got a job in a chemistry lab, and they worked on songs in the evening while the baby was asleep. It was Carol's friend, Neil Sedaka, who hooked them up with Don Kirshner, the man with the golden ear. Kirshner had recently pitched the somewhat unlikely idea of a rock and roll publishing company to industry veteran Al Nevins, 20 years his senior. And the fledgling company was always on the lookout for talented young songwriters. King already had both recommendations and bona fides, and Kirshner was quick to accommodate her needs, allowing her to bring her baby, along with a collapsible playpen, to the office and requisitioning the secretaries as babysitters. Goffin continued to work his day job. The division of labor in the popular music industry of the time was strict, with songwriters composing for specific artists assigned by their employers, frequently on tight deadlines in imitation of prior hits. King and Goffin's breakout hit, Will You Love Me Tomorrow, was written overnight and on assignment for Shirley Owens, lead singer of the all African-American girl group, The Shirelles, as a sideways version of the group's 1960 hit, Tonight's the Night. Owens initially turned it down as too country, meaning too white, but she capitulated after King herself added an arrangement for strings. It was her first time orchestrating a song. In recording the lyrics, Owens ended up imitating King's vocal style from the Aldon demo, and thus, in King's words, trying to sound like me sounding like her, a revealing example of how the division of duties in the Brill Balloon system fostered interracial collaboration, especially between Jewish American composers and African American performers. Indeed, one of the models for King and Goffin's collaboration was Jerry Lieber and Mike Stover, the legendary Jewish songwriting duo who wrote Hound Dog for Big Mama Thornton. Lieber and Stoller would in turn produce many of their hits for, album, for Aldon. Will You Love Me Tomorrow was released on Scepter Records, one of a string of successful labels founded by the legendary housewife turned record producer Florence Greenberg, and quickly rocketed to the top of the Billboard Hot 100 in January 1961, a first for an all-female group, black or white. The song is a classic of the girl group era in terms of both sound and sense. Supported by King's orchestrated string arrangement, it anticipates Phil Spector's signature wall of sound. And with lyrics clearly implying premarital sex from the opening line, just after FDA approval of the birth control pill, the song was suggestive without being explicit, though it was banned from some of the more prudish radio stations. It also presaged the unique sexual dynamics of King and Goffin's collaboration, with King composing the music on piano and Goffin writing the lyrics from a female perspective, frequently with King herself as the model and singer on the, on the demo. At 18, Carol King was little more than a girl herself when the song hit the charts, with Boys by Luther Dixon and Well Wes Farrell on the B-side. And like the girl groups she wrote for, she had little control over her own career and material. Rather, she worked in a cubicle for a corporation owned and operated by men who called women girls, and she produced music that was associated with adolescent frivolity as opposed to high art. As King confirms in her autobiography, we were chattel. 
Though paid fairly well, the couple worked on salary and by assignment with no ownership or control over the songs they wrote. They liked their bosses and their coworkers and appreciated their pay, but they also chafed against the limitations, both cultural and economic. Goffin, in particular, was something of a highbrow whose intellectual pretensions would generate conflict, especially once Bob Dylan came on the scene, directly targeting the commercialism and frivolity of the Brill building system. Now, King may have been called a girl by most of the men she worked with at Aldon, but by the opening of the decade, she was a grown woman by most measures. By 1962, she had two daughters and a full-time job. For the rest of the decade, she would have to juggle family and career while also putting up with Goffin's increasing drug use, mental instability, and serial infidelity as he got swept up in the lively New York City swinging 60s scene. Goffin became particularly erratic over the course of the decade, dropping LSD habitually with consequent episodes of paranoia and panic. And then after being diagnosed with schizophrenia, suffering from depression as a side effect of the Thorazine her doctors prescribed in large doses. At one point, King at the age of 23 had to provide permission for him to receive electroshock therapy. Uh, but the two continued to write and the other song from King's past dates to the later 60s in the couple's collaboration. Written for Aretha Franklin in 1967, You Make Me Feel Like a Natural Woman, in its very title, marks the inception of the political and terminological transition from girl to woman, which would both precipitate and reflect the cresting of feminism's second wave in the late 1960s and early 70s, and it would become a go-to epithet for King herself. The story of its genesis is an industry legend. King and Goffin were walking down Broadway when a huge limousine pulled up alongside them. The rear window slid down and producer Jerry Wexler stuck his head out and said he needed a big hit for Aretha, whom Atlantic had just acquired from Columbia. And he suggested they call it a natural woman. The couple who needed a hit promptly went home and wrote one. The song features some of Goffin's most memorable turns of phrase, including the metaphorical, when my soul was in the lost and found, you came along to claim it. It also once again epitomizes the cross-racial and cross-gender lines of identification that were lost with the rise of rock, now newly without the role, which ironically resegregated the American music industry. King recorded the demo on the very next day and promptly sent it to Wexler, who loved it, as did Aretha herself. Released as a single in 1967, the song rose to number eight on the Billboard Hot 100. In the next year, it was featured as the last track on the first side of Aretha Lady Soul, which swept the Billboard charts, hitting number one as a soul album, number two as a pop album, and number three as a jazz album, emphatically testifying to Aretha's appeal across genre and race. The song became a performance staple for both Franklin and King, as well as an anthem for a generation of women. Like Will You Love Me Tomorrow, A Natural Woman has been covered repeatedly, including by Peggy Lee, Celine Dion, and Mary Bla J. Blige, as well as being adapted into Natural Man by George Benson and Rod Stewart. It is entirely appropriate that it close out Tapestry, emphatically affirming King's independent womanhood as a singer-songwriter, as well as her sisterhood with Aretha. In fact, the peak years of the women's liberation movement coincide with the apogee of the long playing album as an art form, and this is not a historical coincidence. Unlike the 45 RPM single, which was associated both economically and thematically with teenagers and adolescents, the 33 RPM album was associated with maturity and adulthood by both artists and audiences. Singles were the ephemeral product of AM radio, Albums presented more perennial fare for FM stations and home stereo systems, which were becoming increasingly sophisticated and affordable. If singles were listened to on cheap portable turntables by teenagers in the bedrooms of their parents' homes, albums were listened to on expensive stereo systems by adults in their living rooms. And while albums had initially appealed to mostly male clientele, Tapestry confirmed that there was a large untapped market of independent women with money and musical sophistication who would, in the 1970s, be a central economic and cultural driver of the singer-songwriter sound. These albums were the soundtrack of the consciousness raising generation, providing both emotional succor and relationship advice as women reevaluated their personal and professional associations with the men in their lives. The passage from wistful and anxious, will you love me tomorrow to the soaring affirmation of you make me feel like a natural woman on side two of tapestry encapsulates the passage from girl to woman, both for King personally and for the generation of women to and for whom she wrote and sang. The former is interrogative, virginal, uncertain, 
crystallizing the tension and anticipation of a first sexual experience without specifying answer or outcome. The latter can be understood to voice that outcome as an ecstatic confirmation of sexual consummation without guilt or regret. The inexperienced interrogative is supplanted by the confident declarative, adult female sexuality is enacted and affirmed. It is a passage that for Carol King and her cohort would be historically indexed by the triumph that is tapestry. And now I think we can open it up for questions. Okay, Lauren, thank you so much for all your knowledge on this. That was extremely, extremely insightful. Mm -hmm. Um, we do have a few questions here, actually. Um, let me pull them up here. I've been copying them down here. Um, I'm gonna take them in order that we got them. So the first one was, were the backup musicians session players are associated with a specific studio? Were the same players on all or most of the tracks or does it vary? Thanks. Uh, the, those players were on all of those tracks, and they actually did become uh, session players um, for the a &M studios, indeed. Uh, and they've frequently been um, compared to um, what was the group that was on the Beach Boys and the other, uh, I'm going to Wrecking forget. Crew? The Wrecking Crew. Yeah, um, yeah. And they, in fact, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I've forgotten the cohort, the name they had for themselves, but they <laughs> did uh, have a name about themselves, for themselves. And um, if you look on James Taylor's albums and other albums that were recorded by Adler and other producers um, in that studio, uh, they were, they were, you know, hot session musicians um, behind a lot of the soft rock uh, sound that came out of, um, out of Laurel Canyon. And indeed, they've, uh, a, a number Number of them have gathered together again, uh, old bearded sage sages uh, that they are, um, for a band called the Immediate Family. If you want to hear uh, Kochmar and um, Russ Kunkel, um, there's uh, they they uh, still hang out uh, today. But yes, they were That's a cool. cohort and a and a, a studio band, and they That's played great. on all of the, all of the songs. That's great. Um, okay, uh, how did Carol King transition from Brill? to a solo career? Um, well, she, uh, um, it was part, she, in some ways she was part of a, a larger historical phenomenon that has, I guess, two elements. Um, one was the breakdown of the division between songwriting and performing, right? So in the early, in the late 50s and early 60s, it was still common for one set of folks to write the songs and another set of folks to perform them. But Bob Dylan and the Beatles, sort of destroyed all of that as a, um, and he really made it sort of embarrassing to be only performing other people's songs. So uh, she, along with a, a whole, you know, her, all of her generation changed from this, um, you know, this, this separation of labors to an integration of labor around being a, a singer songwriter. Um, but um, it was also um, a movement from New York to California. So the, um, there was a general shift of, of the sort of cultural center of gravity there. And finally, um, I have to say it was, it was an expression of the, of the women's movement, right? She no longer wanted to or needed to uh, depend on her husband for lyrics. Um, she had some feelings and thoughts of her own, although she did throughout her career rely on lyricists and uh, Tony Stern, um, who a, a woman who, who collaborated with her really uh, contributed a lot of important lyrics to uh, to tapestry, but um, as I sort of, you know, it was part of her growing up and it was part of her generation growing up right. and writing and performing your own songs was sort of part of that. It was, it was part of becoming mature as an artist in that, in that time. Right. Great. Thank you. Um, how the next one is we can tell you have a personal attachment to King, like so many of us, did you approach 33 and a third with a book pitch or did they find you somehow? Uh, well, I approached them, but I, I had help. I started attending the Experience Music Project pop conference in Seattle in the, I guess this would have been maybe 10 or 15 years ago. I didn't, I, as, as my, you know, I'm not a music critic or a music scholar. And, you know, I was fascinated and, and uh, inspired by the higher level of integration between industry people and academics in that world. So in the literary world, 
you don't cross over as much with the industry. There's sort of the academia world. I mean, this is changing a little too, but, um, and, and you don't uh, meet or hang out with, I don't know, publishing executives or authors. Um, here, the, the EMP conference and, the, and in general, the world of pop music uh, criticism, there's a lot more cross-fertilization between um, the industry and, and the critics. And I, was, I found that appealing. And then I'll have to say, one of my colleagues um, wrote the 33 and a third for um, uh, Blondie's Parallel Lines. And I was nice. so envious. Uh, um, and it seemed, a, and I started giving talks. And the other thing that happened, it wasn't the, uh, the publisher, but it was my audiences. I started to tell that opening anecdote that I opened my talk with. And it was amazing to me, the audience response I got. People would run up to me afterwards and talk about their connections to Carole King. And also they were fascinated with my childhood in the 70s and the sort of countercultural element. So I felt like I had a pitch or a, you know, a hook. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I use that to, to make a pitch to the Bloomsbury folks. That's great. That's, that's, that's awesome. Um, next question is, you sort of touched on it with how she, of her time period, but I'll, maybe there's a little bit more to this question. How did Carol finally find the confidence to create such a unique songwriting voice? Um, yeah, again, it was part of, uh, I think it was part of um, the I mean, no, it was definitely enabled by women's liberation, the combination of the sexual revolution and women's liberation, which really reoriented um, women's relationship with men um, and in general, what, um, what was seen as the standards of independence for both women and men. Um, she did, now in her book, and by the way, I, I, she still doesn't give interviews, so you can't, um, she does say that uh, James Taylor was enormously encouraging of her. So I, I, I think it's worth saying that meeting James Taylor and going on tour with him and collaborating with him right. um, gave her the confidence both to write her own, write, to write her own lyrics and also to um, perform. She was very shy. Uh, and afraid of performing, um, but Taylor convinced her to come on a, a tour um, with, I think it was called Joe Mama was the name of the, of the band. And so the, the scene there, James Taylor in particular, but also the other folks who were part of the Laurel Canyon scene. And then of course, Lou Adler, Lou Adler had been, you know, had had, had the demos that Carol King made um, in, in New York. Uh, and I think Adler had been just waiting for her to get to a point where she could make an album. I mean, he had, he knew that she could, uh, that she could do that. And then actually, I will also say, um, missing her children and going through the divorce gave her things to write about uh, that weren't about teenagers and, and love affairs. She was starting to have experiences that seemed to merit uh, writing, writing, writing songs, and so I, I think it was the, the convergence of the historical and the personal um, that, uh, that that gave her both the confidence and I guess I would say the material and the context um, to start writing her own music. But I will say she she still always struggled with lyrics, and if you follow her albums over over the decks of the course of the seventies, um, she did still she collaborated with Tony Stern. She still collaborated a little with Goffin um, and some other folks as well. Interesting, very interesting. Um jump a little off of Carol for a second. Uh, any details about Mary Clayton, uh, Mary Clayton's involvement? So uh, Mary Clayton sings uh, incredible backup on, uh, on, on this album. And indeed, I hadn't, I hadn't known that much about Mary Clayton before I read this. Uh, for those of you who don't know, she's most famous uh, for singing the backup for the Rolling Stones, Gimme Shelter, uh, of course, which came out around this time. Lou Adler actually recorded an entire album with Mary Clayton uh, in, in, in 1971. He thought that she was also an incredibly promising singer and musician um, and was deeply disappointed that that album uh, didn't have a, uh, you know, didn't have the success um, that it uh, that it could have had. I should also say um, I was gonna give a joint um, presentation on this album with Ann Powers and Hanif Abdurraqib, um, who's also written about Mary Clayton in his most recent um, uh, book. Um, so if you want to know more about uh, Mary Clayton and her um, uh, her story and her relationship to the to the scene. Um, he's an incredible music writer and is is really just um, firing on all cylinders right now. Uh, so I would I would really encourage folks to um, uh, to to look into that. She was I believe married at the time to the saxophonist on the um, on the record on, uh, who played on um, uh, Tapestry as well. Interesting. Okay. Um, can you talk about the song Tapestry? 
does it reference periods of time in her life? Uh, Tapestry is a fascinating song and it's funny, a lot of times when you mention the album Tapestry, it's not the first song you think of and it's rarely anyone's favorite song, although it's an extremely uh, beautiful song. Um, I, when I write, when I talk, think about that song and when I, I talk about it in the book, I actually talk about it as really representing the pull between dependence and, and confidence, the pull between dependence and independence that's really very much a theme of the album and of, of Carol King's life, um, because there's a sense that there's a male Svengali figure or a male sort of seductive figure in the background that's giving a sort of counter pull um, to the sense of, of confidence and independence that the album gives um, on, another, uh, on another level. It's also, by the way, a uniquely structured song. It just has verses that move across keys. Um, so it uh, it's actually provides a sort of contrapuntal element, both musically and, um, and uh, uh, thematically. Um, it's much more uh, melancholy and solitary in a weird way. You know, most of the songs are relational um, and, and speak uh, of the singer in, in relation to either a lover or friends or, you know, companions. Uh, it's a weirdly lonely song. Um, so I think it's, it's you know, exquisite and, and per perfectly uh, positioned there. Um, I don't know whether she performs it as commonly. She always opened her concerts with You Feel the Earth Move like that. I Feel the Earth Move, that was like just standard. Everyone expected that and it was just sort of set the tone yeah. uh, for anything. And You've Got a Friend, of course, is perennial. Um, uh, tapestry, not as not as uh, popular or commonly um, referenced a song. Indeed, I don't, I don't know anyone who says it's their favorite song on the album and lots of people have a, a favorite song right, right. on the album, but I love it. I think it's it's perfectly positioned right. in the sequence. Great, great. Uh, a patron is asking, they, well, they're, they're letting us know they enjoyed seeing Beautiful here in Chicago yes. and uh, they're a big fan of Carol and they wanna know if you got to see the play. I did get to see it. In fact, I even got to see it on the university's dime because I saw it as, you know, figured it was part <laughs> of research uh, for, uh, for me to go. Um, I thought it was uh, exquisite. It, of course, all, uh, also opens with um, I Feel the Earth Move, although I believe that was not in originally the intent. Indeed, I did do a little research on it, and the uh, producer said that they had initially wanted to focus just on the, you know, on the Alda, on the Brill building period. Um, but that um, that actually what happened is people just said, no, I'm sorry, you've got to include some part of tapestry in it. You can't possibly make um, a musical about Carol King without at least having a piece about tapestry. So they sort of wove uh, tapestry into the fabric, so to speak, um, of that uh, uh, of that um, uh, musical, which really reintroduced and introduced a lot of people to uh, Carol King. I think there were still a lot of fans who weren't fully aware of that, uh, of that backstory. Um, so I just thought it was a, a, a marvelous um, show. And, uh, and, and again, a real, uh, a testimony to the, to the fullness of, of her musical career, which again, what the only liability that Tapestry has is that it was so popular and so perfect that it sort of subordinated the rest of her career, both before and after. You know, there's a lot of people I think who only know that album, don't know about all the songs she wrote before, don't know about all the albums she made afterwards. So uh, it was just great that that, that, that came out. Great. Um, here's a kind of a little personal. Um, the first time you heard the album, do, do you remember? Can you can you talk a little bit about that and maybe your favorite song on the album too? So that is a really funny question because one of the weird experiences I had with this book, and I don't know whether this is common for memoirists, um, is that, so I have, when I started the book, I had enormously distinct memories of listening to my mother's consciousness raising group, of listening to this um, album. I think it was You've Got a Friend and It's Too Late are the songs that I remember both. And, and um, I mean, the first side has those three incredible songs right beginning that you sort of never forget. But weirdly, after I wrote the book, I no longer had, I couldn't remember whether those were memories or whether I had sort of recreated them by writing them. And I, I don't, I, I, if this happens to other memoirists, it's actually a weirdly tragic experience. Once you've got it on the page, yeah. it's sort of gone from your memory. And I can't, and then I, I'm like, well, did I wow. invent it or am I imagining this? Did I make it up? And I, you know, I talked to my mom, she has different memories and, you know, I don't, I, um, uh, but I, um, I have, 
like mood memories of those first few songs, but I don't think I can place an empirical, you know, point in time. I was, I would have been uh, six or seven. I guess I would have been six. I turned seven in March, uh, you know, in, in 1971. Um, so I, I guess my answer is weirdly yes and no. And, and writing the book both sort of confirmed the memories and undermined them at the, at the same time. It was a very uh, vaguely unsettling experience. Yeah, that, that's so interesting. You know, music has always been a thing. It's almost like time travel. Some, yes. Sometimes it's like, did, did I experience this? Or is it something <laughs> I remembered or I picked it up somewhere? So that I totally hear what you're saying with that. Um, we have another question here. We're coming near the end of the questions. Um, in her memoir, King said she played in his band on a leg of Taylor's tour and he pushed her to sing one of her big songs will you love me tomorrow and the crowd ate it up so I don't, that might be more of a comment than a question that sounds know. yeah that uh, that sounds right and then um finally uh they um I mean it was at the troubadour of course that she gave her vote her first solo um uh performances and those are legendary but yes it was uh and that's exactly right King uh when, and I, I guess this clarifies an earlier question too. When King went to Los Angeles, she was going there because Goffin had gone there and people, other people were going there and she wanted the best for her kids. She wanted her kids to still be close to their father. Uh, she had no um, ambition to be a performer. She saw, thought that she was still gonna be uh, a singer songwriter. And indeed, um, many feel that her first uh, two albums, right? Tapestry was actually her third album. She made an album with Korchmar and Larky under a band called The City. Uh, called um, Now That Everything's Been Said. And then she came out with another album called Writer. Um, but she refused to tour and she also refused to do any publicity. So it made it a lot harder to promote the albums um, and, and get them out there. So it wasn't until uh, Tapestry came out that she really started both writing her own songs and finally established the, um, the, the courage um, to, to go out there. And then, you know, and, and people, really loved her from the beginning and everyone and then everyone in the in the papers they always called her fans friends so it was all, you know so the performing was like this friendship circle or something and and one of the things about carol king that has you know i mean she wasn't a flamboyant performer she seemed really authentic there uh and indeed you know her later tour they called it the living room tour uh you sort of felt as if you were hanging out with her in a casual space um so in the end her her shyness created a performance persona uh that was enormously appealing to people but she uh you know she had to overcome a lot of stage fright and a lot of resistance to to get to that point that's great you know i'm so influenced by your your comments on her later career. I, I know all of her early hits. I'm, I'm a fan of early rock music and she was, you know, such a machine, part of that machine. And I'm so inspired to go listen to her later stuff. Now I'm going to have to go past Tapestry and uh, get a little deeper here. Um, and I think that's about it for all the questions here. I'm just scanning to make sure I didn't miss anything. And it looks like I got them all. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? Um, maybe I'll just read just a, a, another page or so to close us off. Okay. Tapestry made Carole King into an international superstar, but she was a reluctant celebrity, and this reluctance contributed to the nature of her fame. Her insistence on maintaining her private privacy ironically resulted in a public image closely associated with the private, private sphere. Furthermore, the definitions of and boundaries between public and private were undergoing transformation in the 1970s, and the relationship between King's private life and public image reflected these developments for her fans. The sexual revolution had dramatically increased pu public discussion and display of erotic imagery and intimate experience, while the second wave feminist pronouncement that the personal is political compelled many to consider the degree to which sex and sexuality are suffused with patriarchal power dynamics. At the same time, white middle class women like King were increasingly entering professional and political spheres, challenging the old boy networks at, that had heretofore run the world. The result was for many a wholesale renegotiation of the relationship between intimate experience and public expression. Tapestry emerged as a soundtrack to these transformative experiences and it made Carol King a star. Her coronation was nationally announced by Time Magazine on July 12th, 1971 with a piece entitled King as Queen, situating her as first among equals in a group including Carly Simon, Rita Coolidge and Linda Ronstadt. 
The profile opens with two paragraphs of backstory introducing King as a young Jewish girl from Brooklyn who pioneered the sound of uptown rhythm and blues in New York City before arriving in Los Angeles and launching her solo career. While many of her fans were unaware of the interracially intertwined backstory, it was well known to music journalists and almost always chronicled and commented upon in their profiles and reviews for this period. The fact that she was a Jewish American woman from Brooklyn who honed her style writing for and imitating African American vocalists informed her public image, even for those who were unaware of these crucial details. Changing her name to conceal her ethnic antecedents while adopting African American musical idioms placed King in American tradition running back through Al Jolson and the vaudeville stage, simultaneously complicating and confirming her claims to authenticity. The article then emphasizes King's low musical profile, both professionally and personally, describing her taking the stage at Carnegie Hall in an unpretentious print dress, looking somewhat frail and plaintive. But this all changes when she sits down to play, I feel the earth move, and her profile eloquently registers the transformation that occurs once she begins thumping out the initial piano chords and wailing the opening lines. The author of the article describes her voice as a Canarsie twang and, the decept and with the deceptive strength of a whip antenna, the first of many attempts to capture the unique combination of fragility and strength that characterizes both King's singing style and public image. The profile concludes by noting that she lets very little disturb the life she has arranged for herself in the Laurel Canyon house in Los Angeles, where she tends to her nine and 11 year old daughters by her first marriage. The article features Tapestry's already ubiquitous cover photo with the tagline, Carol King and friend at home in LA. As we have seen, it was as a friend and mother that King presented herself on Tapestry and the press cooperated in creating this syncretic image, which has remained remarkably stable over the course of her long career. Profiles inevitably mention her de devotion to her daughters and commonly refer to her fans as friends. In a period of fractured families and rising divorce rates, King offered the radical image of a stable domesticity and comfortable camaraderie without a father. That's beautiful. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much for this. This has been, it's been great having you. Thank you for sharing all your knowledge with us. Uh, I'd like to thank Glenview, Arlington Heights, Addison, and my home library, Northbrook's Library, patrons for attending. Uh, we hope to see patrons next month on August 18th, and we're going to be doing Devo's Freedom of Choice. Thank you, right. everyone.